right, here we go. Another episode of Canada on the Rocks. I am your host, Fadi Kudair. And today we are joined with one of my really good friends from probably about 15, 20 years almost. We're, we're getting old, so we're, it's, we uh, it's hard to keep old. track. We are definitely, <laughs> definitely aging ourselves here. Uh, so we have with us today Ferris El Sabag from Ottawa General Contractors, who comes highly recommended from other sources as well, too, that have been on the show. And as well as, you know, the friendship that we have. I want to talk a little bit more, if, if that's okay with you. We dig into your history. Sure. If that's okay with you. Uh, so I, I know that, you know, you came here to North America as a refugee. Mm-hmm. Tell me a little bit more about that. Because, again, that's an inspiring story. I'd love to for the audience to kind of know a little bit more about it uh, and learn how you can become an entrepreneur when you're from that kind of background. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. You know, it's funny, right? Because... I actually didn't know I was a refugee until I was like in my twenties. <laughs> weird, right? Yeah, yeah. And when I reflect on that, parents are really good at sheltering us. For well, sure. yeah, and and like you know, being Palestinian, I can in, in one way or another, we're kind of all refugees. Mm-hmm. You know, whether we're even refugees in our own land, right? And when I kind of reflect on that, it's like, how did you not even know? Why didn't you not know? You know, you ask all these different questions, and it's just like it's kind of like what you said. Like you know, our parents shelter us from that because, you know. They've dealt with so much, they're not okay with weakness. And maybe potentially refu- being a refugee can be considered a little bit weak. Maybe it could be, you know, I'm not sure if I'm really pre-framing that properly, but maybe it comes from a certain place where it's just like, no, you know what? We're not going to have self-pity. We're not, we're not here to pity ourselves. Mm-hmm. We are here um, to make something of ourselves. You know, that was kind of the constant theme. My mom always would say that, you know, I wanted to bring you guys to North America, first of all, for a better education. And certain things happened in the Middle East that that got, you know, fast tracked and was to make something of our lives where we didn't necessarily have that opportunity, you know, back home. And I mean, like, you know, the constant theme, I think, for Palestinians, too, is just like, you know, how do you get out of these kind of circumstances? And I kind of pick up on is through education. 100 percent. I think if uh, per capita, if I would go back, like I remember being back home and Literally per capita, we had the most amount of PhDs I've ever seen in my life. You know, it was is it's like kind of like in North America. You know, when you're like in the hood, the way out of the hood is to be a rapper. Yeah. You know, for yeah. Palestinians, is the only way out is through education. Get a PhD in something, or a, a, being a doctor, or being an engineer, and 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 then bigger opportunities yeah. would arise in various different countries, or whether different you know um, uh, NGOs would provide you some kind of funding to be able to get out or to continue your mm-hmm. education or whatever. Be it. So like my mom never really. And, and it's funny because, like, I'm starting to use the word refugee. My mom doesn't like that, mm-hmm. you know, even though that, that's what it was because she's just like um, – and, and I think it just comes back from a place where it's like she always set the bar really high yeah. for my brothers and I. Like, this is who you're going to be. This is what it's going to take. And usually it revolved around, you know, education and hard work and just the kind of, like, the mentality. So, um you know, long story short, you know, we uh, we came from the Middle East, um, you know, as refugees when I was like five or six years old, originally to the U.S. And then uh, in grade four, I can't remember how old I would have been, um, maybe, uh, I don't know, like nine or something like that. Uh, we moved to Canada, to Ottawa. And um, yeah, and, and, you know, my father worked basically 12, 15 hours days, um, you know, as a taxi driver. Uh, trying to put food on the table, terrible hours, 4 p.m. to 4 a.m., so I never yep. saw him. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, my my mom was uh, very educated in the Middle East, worked at the Kuwait oil company in, in a really high job for a woman in the 70s and 80s and and came to just take and, you know, worked at home. Or Sorry, I didn't work at home. She took care of my brothers and I, um, you know, making sure that we got to school every day and took us to football practice four times a week times three brothers. You can imagine what that looked like. and. Yeah. And really, like, made sure that we stayed out of trouble, although we tested her a lot, you know. And she just kind of stuck to her guns to make sure that, um, you know, uh, we we were staying out of trouble and kind of keeping on that course. Because she really dedicated her life to us. And, yeah. and same with my father. Because you know how it is for, for uh, you know, a lot of our Palestinian families that, you know, it's like, okay, um, we, you know, the, the older generation got out of chaos. Now it's time to set up the younger generation for success. Mm-hmm. And, and so, you know, some of the proudest moments from my mom now is like, you know, I, I recently got awarded 40 under 40 by the Ottawa Business Journal and the, and the Telfer School of Business kind of gave me a shout out. So to her, like this higher um, uh, educational institution giving me a shout out was like some of the, you know, 
a pinnacle of her yeah. her kind of like achievements of focusing on on us. And so it, my, my mom's cute because the Telfer um, dean sent me an email and I sent it to my mom. And then she she actually framed the email. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny how She's parents so cute. are like they, one thing about my parents, and I'm gonna share this with you, being a little bit vulnerable here. They are so good at not telling you how proud they are with you. Right. But they'll tell the whole world yeah. how proud of them, yeah. how proud of you they are and all of that. It's always like Really? My mom said this? Yeah. Story? Yeah, she did. Okay, okay. Well, it's good to know. Yeah. But that's the thing. It's because they like they grew hard. Yeah. You know? And they, they're passing on that hard to us in a way that we can, you know, go on and produce. And then this is one of the reasons why, like, a lot of people are like, how do you go about doing this so many things in a day? And I said, to me, that's the only way that right. I can get myself out and get my, my family out and, and trying to help them out and all of that. Absolutely. Yeah. Getting us ready for, for how hard this life can be. Um and and the challenges that kind of come your way and and uh, being able to just kind of like roll with the punches, you know, and yeah, I mean, look, you know, uh, very fortunate kind of for for that history. But it's it's funny when you look back because when you're in that moment, you don't really you know no. you don't really think about it like that, you know. Maybe maybe you don't have as much as everybody else does, but you know, and I think in a lot of Palestinian families, you know, there's a lot of care and a lot of love as well. I mean, um, and I, and sometimes that's all you really need. That is all you need a yeah. lot of times. Now we kind of went a little vulnerable here for a second. <laughs> Let's go back to the task at hand. Uh, yeah. So I'm just going to talk a little bit more about like the, the diversification that you guys have at Ottawa General. Tell me a little bit more about that, the, the type of folks that you hire, uh, and also the setup as far as, you know, you said there's about 40 plus employees. Tell me a little bit more about that as well, too. Yeah, you know, it's, it's funny because, I mean, I don't do a lot of the hiring anymore, but something that, that um, I really used to look for when I was hiring somebody was if they were just going to smile. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't know if I was on the right track with that or not, but so far so good in terms of the people that I've been bringing on board. But, like, I really think it's important that, okay, on one side you've got the skill and you've got the talent. But, you know, and I kind of touched on this earlier, but on the other side, like, you got to work with pleasant people. And I think that's even more important in construction because there's a lot of friction, a lot of conflict, a lot of disputes in construction. And you want to be able to kind of work with people who are thinking about how they can progress a situation. Yeah. On how they can move forward and not just, you know, uh, get stuck in this kind of like limbo of just like trying to cast blame and trying to complain so i've i've really put um a lot of focus on on hiring pleasant people but people who also understand the importance of communication and know how to communicate because mm -hmm. communication is also a lot more than just speaking or getting a point across yeah you know effective communication not only uh, do you need to get a point across but you need to ensure the person who's receiving the communication interpreted it the way you want it to be yeah and, and to me, that's the m most important yeah, part. Yeah. And, and this is where, like, a lot of the times I, uh, I I tend to ask that phrase at the end, like, does that make sense? Do you yeah. understand? Can you repeat it back to me? Because I just want to make sure that we're on the same page. Right. Regardless of what that is. Because you never know. Like, I'm, I'm saying it one way. You're saying it another way. And it's perspective at the end of the day. Right. Is really what matters. Yeah. Um, so as far as the uh, projects that you guys take on, uh, with Ottawa General, what do those look like? What's sort of like the the mix, if you will? Yeah, like the um, the average project that we're working on these days are like um, coach homes. We're doing a lot of coach homes, which are those mini homes in the backyard. Mm -hmm. um, you know, with the expensive costs of land these days, you know, being about what four or five hundred thousand dollars for a lot. Mm -hmm. A lot of homeowners have free land in their backyard, right? Um, land where they can uh, that doesn't cost them anything because they already own the main home. And they could just build a little mini home in their backyard. And these uh, these homes are great for adult children, you know, that can't necessarily afford the current market rate. So their parents are uh, allowing them to build a little home in their backyard. They're great for aging adults who don't necessarily need the big main home, uh, need to downsize, and maybe they can give that bigger home to to their children, or they can use it for extra income while they retire. Uh, or for your average investor who's just kind of looking for some passive income. Yeah. Um, coach homes have been a huge hit for us. Home additions, expanding their homes, uh, but also multifamilies. So 
Every home in Ottawa now can become a three unit as per Bill 23. And by the end of next year, that's going to switch to four units. So doing a lot of three unit conversions on, um, you know, single homes. We're, we already do a lot of like SDUs, secondary and dwelling units. that's only for single, not necessarily like a... Believe it or not, the actual bylaw allows that for single homes, townhouses, and semi-detached. Wow. Now, if you can meet all the bylaw regulations from a fire rating perspective and whatnot for these types of builds is a whole nother story. Uh, but but that's actually why you'd probably go to a design, do the initial kind of investigation, the preliminary designing and planning to figure out, you know, if it's feasible. But uh, yeah, but we're, we're really pushing hard into multifamilies. Um, you know, whether we like it or not as homeowners, um, we're going through a bit of a paradigm shift here, a bit of a shift in, in urban planning in, in the city of Ottawa where more units are needed and, and uh, the official plan uh, is allowing for essentially higher density buildings. So yeah. what does that mean? I predict basically like a low rise apartment building in every neighborhood in Ottawa uh, by in, in 2026 onwards. Yeah. Well, Ottawa is a little bit ahead. Like, uh, for example, like the, the Royal Homes has been, have been going around in Ottawa for 25, 30 years, right? And you go to uh, Calgary or what have you, they're not as common. They are common, but not as common as, as much as Ottawa, not as dense as much as Ottawa. But it also has to do with the fact that when you're looking at Ottawa and the way it's, it's sitting on sort of like the, the Ottawa River, there's really no expansion north. You know, right. the only expansion, the only way you can move is, is going south. Right. Uh, and there is that one asset that no matter what, we can't make more of. It's the land. Right. right. I'm not about to, you know, just go live in Greeley and just get downtown and, and, you know, do that 40 minute commute every morning. Right. If I can move into a smaller unit and then just maybe do a 20 minute commute, 15 minute commute. That's probably why we're seeing all of that. And it's the, the shift is, is phenomenal. Like the, the, the way it's going, like I'm, I'm talking to builders like yourselves, like almost regularly on how they're doing those shifts and then the, the flip the design. Um, a lot of things too, that we've been noticing is that multifamily sort of multi-generational, uh, sort of living as well too that's been becoming a little bit more common here in Ottawa uh, which you alluded to with the with the coach homes a lot of folks that are okay I'm retiring and you know I don't necessarily want to move into uh, an old age right and that's another industry that we could go on and talk about for, right. for hours because it's it's booming especially with the baby boomers mm -hmm. you know coming out of the uh, you know that that age kind of that they're all coming into it and if you are in that industry you're making a killing right now Right. Uh, but a lot of them are still in good shape. They're still really healthy. They don't necessarily want to be in an old age home. They want to be right next to their children and having something like the coach home. Yeah, multi-generational living has become very popular. Um, maybe it always has been, but um, with the ability to build higher density kind of um, units on these existing yeah. lots, it's probably enabled it a lot more. Um, you know, we're seeing it, we're seeing it all across the board and it kind of makes sense, right? Especially like, okay, if you've got like a single home and you could potentially tear that down and build an eight unit. And so not only is, um, you know, the, the, the person who's retiring or getting a little bit older that wants to age in place that doesn't want to go to an old age home that's still, you know, pretty mobile can live in one of the main floor units mm -hmm. and earn additional income from the from the rest of the other units while leaving an, a, a really good income producing asset for their children yeah. down the road. So um, I think we're going to see a lot more of that. But these are some of the clients that we're seeing today. Yeah. And what are some of the ways that you can, you know, as a homeowner that you're looking at maximizing your investment? What are some of the ways that to, to be able to kind of find out those information, where to go and all of that stuff. Yeah, you know, it's it's really difficult right now because we're at a time where the city of Ottawa is just going through consultations on approving um, a lot of these different changes. And there's, you know, a bit of a, like, a, I don't know how you say it, like... Red tape. Red tape, <laughs> bureaucracy play. Oh, yeah. They're going through yeah. the motions of public consultations. You know, I don't want to sound pessimistic, but it almost just sounds like theater, like that they have to do this. Like yeah. they already know what they're doing. But they have to go through this. So there's there's some stuff that you can find um, on the City of Ottawa website, spe specifically Engage Ottawa. But if they reach out to us, um, we're very versed with what's coming down the pipeline. Um, we're, we're happy to do free consultations at Ottawa General Contractors uh, where we can kind of um, give them some information on what they're looking to do and how they can do it and when they can do it by. Yeah. Because certain things can happen now. Certain things can't happen until 2026. Mm -hmm. So just by knowing the timing and all of that, like you could definitely put a plan in motion and say, okay, well, 
this particular one is not really happening until 2026. Maybe right. I'll wait until the zoning becomes eligible and then kind of go from there. Right. Now, that being said as well, too, like uh, even if the zoning doesn't allow for it now, there's something called committee, uh, like getting a variance, going through the committee of adjustments, and they're a little bit more favorable of giving those kind of permissions, you know, within a certain parameter um, while keeping in mind that these changes are coming anyways. Yeah. So you can kind of get ahead of the curve if it's, if they're not drastic changes, but uh, really what it comes down to is, you know, we, we've got like a three-step process for, for clients that are looking to do stuff like that with the first step, uh, being like a feasibility study. So we'll do like, um, a bylaw coding review. We'll do a quick site, site plan, uh, elevation site plan, sorry, where we kind of show them, you know, uh, what it looks like, what they potentially want to do on their current lot. And we'll also have uh, preliminary discussions with a city planner because you can't just necessarily find a lot of this information online. So we, we have the information, but we also have to kind of make our own judgment call and then go and validate that with a city planner. Mm -hmm. So we've got kind of like a, a product set up for that. What does that look like in terms of, and it doesn't have to be an exact number, in terms of a range of cost as far as, hey, I want to do a feasibility and figure out if this is actually something that I could do. Yeah, I mean, no, we it's, it's roughly about 1000 to $2,000 to do the feasibility. Um, it's not an extensive process, uh, but it is something that allows us to get concrete information or at least information from a planner that they're willing to support a certain change. In some cases, you don't necessarily need to go through a variance and get these special permissions, if you will. In some cases, uh, it's already kind of permitted because there's been some uh, bylaw uh, approvals that have already been passed to allow for higher density building. Like for example, a lot of the houses in Vanier can now pretty much be an eight to 10 unit, more yeah. or less. Yeah. You know, there's been a lot of uh, updates the last couple of years on that. That's amazing. And that's, again, because of the proximity to downtown, the ability to gentrify the area as well, too, and then exactly. clean it up a little bit. Uh, I've seen a lot of, actually, townhomes in Vanier that are turned into SDUs, which is insane, yeah. in, in my opinion, but it, it works. Yeah. Um, so I don't want to digress too, too much. I want to go back a little bit more to Ottawa General Contractors as far as your projects. Is it mostly residential? Is it a mix of both? Tell me a little bit more about yeah, that. Yeah, I would say it's like 90, 95% residential. I mean, we'll do a little bit of commercial work specifically if our clients uh, have commercial units that they want us to work on. We don't necessarily go after commercial work. Mm -hmm. I mean, some people can consider multifamily commercial, so it depends how you define that. Yeah. We look at it still as residential, but yeah, primarily residential. Um, we're getting a lot into uh, multifamily development. So we've got, um, you know, two eight unit, but we got an eight unit building in active construction, two eight unit buildings we're starting next week and um, a uh, 21,000 square foot, 24 unit that we're either starting this summer or next spring. We're still working on a few details there. What's the average sort of time frame for a project like this, like an eight unit, 10 unit? For example, uh, eight. You're you're looking at like eight to ten months from shovels in the ground, and uh, a few factors can you know uh, can kind of matter when it comes to that. But roughly speaking, eight to ten. Nice, nice. Interesting. There's so much to learn in the construction industry. There's so much to learn specifically in the development site. I find that it's it's actually it's it's the most interesting part of my real estate. You know, working in real estate is knowing about what's coming down the pipe, the, you know, the ways that you can maximize your investment as a, as a homeowner or as a landowner. Uh, and then you're always learning. You're always, always learning. Really appreciate you coming on the show. Um, it's been, it's been a while that we were trying to do this. So I really appreciate it. And, uh, say hi to your partner for me as well too. I'll probably just send him a quick message. Uh, and I want to kind of let the folks know if, if you guys want to know more information about Ottawa general contractors, don't for, you know, go ahead and follow Mo Mo and also, uh, Ferris here. Uh, make sure that if you like what you see, hit the like and subscribe button so we can get more and more episodes like this and you can learn more about businesses in Ottawa. Uh, and if you have any comments as far as a business that you would like us to kind of bring on the show, please let me know. Uh, shoot us a quick comment or send a message. I'd love to, uh, to have you on the show as well. Thanks again, Ferris. Really appreciate it, man. Thanks, Fatty. Appreciate you having me out here, man. It was Looking fun. Looking forward to do more and more business with you as well, too. Let's do it. Appreciate it.